Madam Clerk, if you will uh, read the roll. Director Hendricks. Director Richardson. Here. Director Peck. Here. Director Hines. Present. Director Wright. Here. Director Ryrick. Here. Director Compiris. Present. Director Fortson. Here. Director Adcock. Present. Vice Mayor Webb. Here. Mayor Stradola. Thank you, and we will call on uh, Director Hendricks to say the invocation. I'm not sure what you said there. Bruce, is this a regular meeting? Yeah. <laughs> My usual prayer is that the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in God's sight is my prayer. Amen. Amen. Will you please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, the first thing we will do, if you will look at your agendas, is that we do have some um, modifications to make on the agenda. And so, uh, Mr. Moore, will you please explain the modification M1? Yes, Vice Mayor, members of the board, uh, in working with the city attorney's office, um, our uh, third party administration for our self funded workers compensation program expires um, at the end of uh, this month. Um, so I need to uh, waive the competitive process. And as you can see, this is only for a nine month period, which will allow us to work with our uh, HR and our purchasing department to put a, a bid out. Uh, there is a motion and second to add to the uh, grouped items. All those in favor? Uh, opposed? <coughs> I apologize, Director Hendricks. I didn't see your. Uh... Say that again, what you mentioned. Sure. We have a third party administrator for our self funded workers' compensation program that the city uh, uh, implements. Uh, that expires at the end of this month. Uh, so in working with our city attorney, uh, he recommended this approach to go forward for a sole source for a nine month period, which will allow us to go out for bid and ensure that this, uh, we have a third party starting July 1st. Tom, you want to add anything? Who is the third party? Can you say? Uh, risk management resources. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Director Richardson, do you have a question? Thank you, Vice Mayor. Bruce, what, what's the rationale for sole source? Mr. Carpenter. Director Richardson, the contract ends at the end of this month. There, uh, we, we need to get the records in order to show that we have competitively bid this contract within a certain period of time. We're not going to be able to do that before the 30th, and y'all's next meeting is the 5th. So what we did is we checked with the risk management company. They were willing to extend this for a nine-month period of time. We made this a sole source ordinance for that period of time because we've got to have it in place as a part of our requirements of being a self-insured uh, workers' comp company. And so that's the reason. So is this something we've done before? We've done it before when we've had emergency situations. You've got one more on there tonight about workers' comp, and we're going to get this all worked out. And this is considered an emergency? It is, because if we don't have it after June the 30th, then we're not in compliance with state law. Thank you, Tom. Director Hines, was your question about this as well? Uh, no, Vice Mayor Webb. I have a... Uh, on the consent agenda, I have an item that I have some questions on before we vote, it's, vote on it since I wasn't here. So I'll let you finish with the Okay. Um, we passed the motion, and we have added item M1, and it will be after ordinance number 8. That's when we will deal with that. Uh, we also have some deferrals, 
and we have a request to defer at the applicant's request to defer items 10, 11, and 14 to the July 18th meeting. And uh, will there be a motion and a second to defer? Second. Okay, there is a motion and a second to defer. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion passes, so those items will be deferred. Madam Clerk, will you please read the, oh, sorry, Director Hines. We, Director Br Hines. Bruce, I just had a couple quick questions. On, on uh, resolution two on the nine new uh, police cars, so why wasn't this covered in our original contract we just approved? Director Hines, um, What's happened is we have uh, established uh, some additional uh, units as, as we've reported our, our violent uh, reduction team. Uh, we added to that team that uh, originally when we went out with the lease uh, and just in talking with the, the assistant chiefs and Captain Terrell, uh, these are just nine additional that we need to, um, as because we've added some okay. specialized units. And, and these seem to be at a higher rate than the other cars we lease. So what what's the reason for that? That they didn't go under the original contract. Captain Terrell, Vice Mayor, Board of Directors. I'm Captain Ty Terrell, Commander of Special Investigations. Mm -hmm. These nine vehicles, they're going to break down. Um, three are going to VCATs. Two will go to major crimes, uh, two will go to headquarters to emergency management, and then two will come out to me in special investigations. Uh, the slightly higher rate is the type vehicles, so we have a wide variety of vehicles, and the lateness, it, the vendor has a little bit harder time acquiring vehicles. Okay, and and then was there a reason we didn't rebid it, just we, since this was the, a second? We haven't even received the first 37 vehicles okay. that you approved yet, so we're trying okay. to add to that original 37. And so these are these are vehicles that weren't specifically specified in the original? No, or no. They're the, bigger the, vehicles? The process or? to get the 37 vehicles started back in November, and okay. as we moved through the process, it took so long. We've added vehicles to VCATs. We created emerging man, emergency management. Um, we added the cold case people to major crimes, and then I've been allowed to fill two vacant positions out at SID. Okay. So, Those so this, requirements didn't exist in November when we started this process. Okay. And so this is more cars than we had on the previous contract? Yes, sir. Okay. It is, but we're also considerably under budget from what we were with the previous vendor. Even though we're getting more vehicles, we're remaining um, close okay. to 50000 under the budget. All right. Thank you. Director Richardson. Yes, Captain Terrell. Um, one other quick question. Are these units used for special operations? I heard Bruce make reference to the violent reduction team. The cats are going to pick up three of the the undercover vehicles. So it'll be for a specialized operations. Um, there's nothing going to the division special operations, but they're all these are all undercover vehicles that will be used for surveillance and for the work that my guys do out there in vice and narcotics. None of them are marked. None of them have blue lights. Unmarked. They're completely unmarked. They just look like your regular old Toyota Camry or Ford Fusion or whatever they happen to be, sir. Thank you, Captain. Thank you, Captain. Madam Clerk, will you please read the consent agenda? A motion to approve the minutes of the January 17, 2017, February 7, 2017, and February 21, 2017, Little Rock City Board of Directors meeting. A resolution to amend Little Rock, Arkansas, resolution number 14,540, April 8, 2017, to authorize the city manager to lease up to an additional nine cars for the Little Rock Police Department in an amount not to exceed $67,748, pursuant to entering a lease agreement with Enterprise FM Trust by Enterprise Fleet Management, Inc., it is its attorney, in fact, and for other purposes. A resolution to authorize the city manager to enter into a contract with Sunbelt Fire in the amount of $1,145,421 for the purchase of two E1 custom pumpers on Cyclone 2 chassis for the Little Rock Fire Department utilizing the Houston-Galveston Area Cooperative Purchasing Agreement and for other purposes. 
to authorize a resolution to authorize the city manager to enter into a contract with FTN Associates LTD in an amount not to exceed $230,000 to provide technical consulting services for the two, 2017 GIS stormwater system mapping and data collection and for other purposes. I have a motion and a second to, prove, to approve the consent agenda. All in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? <coughs> the consent agenda passes. Now we'll go to the ordinances. Madam Clerk, if you would please read items 5 through 8 and M1. An ordinance to approve a plan zoning development and establish a planned office district titled Markham Harrison Properties, short form PDO, located at 5307 A Street, Little Rock, Arkansas, amending the official zoning map of the city of Little Rock, Arkansas, and for other purposes. An ordinance to condemn certain structures in the city of Little Rock, Arkansas as structural fire and health hazards to provide for summary abatement procedures to direct city staff to take such action as is necessary to raise and remove said structures to declare an emergency and for other purposes. To an ordinance to authorize the issuance of a promissory note to provide short-term financing under amend amendment number 78 to the Arkansas Constitution for the acquisition and installation of tangible personal property prescribing others other matters pertaining thereto to declare an emergency and for other purposes. An ordinance to dispense with the requirement of competitive bidding as impractical and unfeasible to award a contract to Safety National to provide workers' compensation stop-loss coverage to the City of Little Rock, Arkansas for a one-year period from July 1, 2017 to June 30, 2018 to declare an emergency and for other purposes. And M1. Um, an ordinance to dispense with the requirement of competitive bidding as impractical and unfeasible to award a contract to risk management resources to provide third-party administration services for the city's self-funded workers' compensation program for a nine-month period from July 1, 2017 to March 31, 2018 to declare an emergency and for other purposes. I have a motion and a second to suspend the rules and place the grouped items on second reading. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Madam Clerk, would you please read the grouped items uh, a second time? An ordinance to approve a plan zoning de development and establish a planned office district titled Markham Harrison Properties, short form PDO, located at 5307 A Street. An ordinance to condemn certain structures in the city of Little Rock, Arkansas as a structural fire and health hazards to provide for summary abatement procedures to direct city staff to take such an action as is necessary to raise and remove said structures to declare an emergency. An ordinance to authorize the issuance of a promissory note to provide short-term financing under amendment number 78 to the Arkansas Constitution for the acquisition and installation of tangible personal property prescribing other matters pertaining thereto to declare an emergency. An ordinance to dispense with the requirement of competitive bidding as impractical and unfeasible to award a contract to safety national to provide workers compensation stop loss coverage to the city of Little Rock, Arkansas for a one year period from July 1st, 2017 to June 30th, 2018 to declare an emergency. An ordinance to dispense with the requirement of competitive bidding as impractical and unfeasible to award a contract to risk management resources to provide third party administrative services for the city's self funded workers compensation program for a nine month period from July 1st, 2017 to March 31st, 2018 to declare an emergency. I have a motion and a second to suspend the rules and place on third uh, and final reading. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Madam Clerk, would you read the ordinances? An ordinance to approve a planned zoning development and establish a planned office district titled Markham Harrison Property, short form PDO, located at 5307 A Street, Little Rock, Arkansas, amending the official zoning map of the city of Little Rock, Arkansas, and for other purposes. 
an ordinance to condemn certain structures in the city of Little Rock, Arkansas as structural fire and health hazards to provide for summary abatement procedures to direct city staff to take such action as is necessary to raise and remove said structures to declare an emergency. An, an ordinance to authorize the issuance of a promissory note to provide short-term finance financing under amendment number 78 to the Arkansas Con Constitution for the acquisition and installation of tangible personal property prescribing other matters pertaining thereto to declare an emergency. To dispense an ordinance to dispense with the requirement of competitive bidding as impractical and unfeasible to award a contract to Safety National to provide workers' compensation stop loss coverage to the City of Little Rock, Arkansas for a one year period from July 1st, 2017 to June 30th, 2018 to declare an emergency. An ordinance to dispense with the requirement of the competitive bidding as impractical and unfeasible to award a contract to risk management so resources to provide third-party administra administration services for the city's self-funded workers' compensation program for a nine-month period from July 1, 2017 to March 31, 2018 to declare an emergency. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, the items have been read. We have no cards and I have no buttons, so we'll move to a vote on the grouped items. Um, all in favor? Opposed? The grouped items pass and we do have some emergency clauses. So we will first go to um, ordinance number six. Um, all in favor of the emergency clause? Aye. Opposed? The emergency clause passes. Item number seven has an emergency clause. All in favor of the emergency clause? Opposed? The emergency clause passes. Item eight, all in favor of the emergency clause? Aye. Opposed? The emergency clause passes. And ordinance uh, item M1, all in favor of the emergency clause? Aye. Opposed? The emergency clause passes. And now we will go to the separate items Madam Clerk, will you please read item number nine. An ordinance to approve a plan zoning development and establish a plan commercial district titled James Mitchell School Revised Short Form PCD located at 2410 South Battery Street, Little Rock, Arkansas, amending the official zoning map of the city of Little Rock, Arkansas and for other purposes. There's a motion and a second to suspend the rules and place on second reading. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Madam Clerk, will you uh, read the ordinance? An ordinance to approve a plan zoning development and establish a plan commercial district titled James Mitchell School Revised Short Form PCD located at 2410 South Battery Street, Little Rock, Arkansas, amending the official zoning map of the city of Little Rock, Arkansas and for other purposes. There's been a motion and a second to suspend the rules in place on third and final reading. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Uh, we do have cards on this item. Uh, and first, I'd mm. like to know if the applicant has a, would, is here and uh, would like to make a presentation. Directors and Vice Mayor, <clears throat> my name is Chad Young. I'm with WDND Architects uh, here in Little Rock, uh, representing the uh, owner, and uh, we're in charge of uh, the renovation for the uh, James Mitchell School. And I've brought some images with me uh, to show you guys what we're uh, proposing to do with the existing school. This uh, original school was built in 1908. Uh, it's currently uh, boarded up and vacant. Um, you can see the image on the left. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? The image on the left is uh, the image that at its current state. It's boarded up right now. Uh, it's about 42,000 square feet of an existing school facility. It's sitting there. Um, what's on the right is what we're planning on doing. It is on the historic register, and uh, we are taking it through the National Park Service uh, guidelines to uh, restore it back to its original 1908 condition at the historic portion of the property. 
Um, if you'd go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is the uh, side view of behind the 1908 structure and adjoining the uh, more recent additions uh, to the left of that is the uh, 1980 and 1990 edition. And we're going to provide a, uh, a link that basically ties all three buildings on this uh, campus together. Um, that way we have one ADA accessible entrance in the building. Uh, this will be our, our sort of primary entrance in the facility. Um, it, the school's starting off with around 300 uh, students if it's a proposed charter passes in July. Um, but we are on track with um, the construction drawings and, and trying to issue those out uh, uh, within the next uh, week or so. Um, go to the next image. Uh, this is a site plan view of the overall uh, property. You can see the existing buildings, the, the light yellow shaded areas that link uh, that I was talking about that joins all three of those uh, buildings there on the campus. It's a two-level building or two-level addition that will tie everything together, uh, making everything totally ADA accessible. We have a new elevator we're adding into the original 1908 building. Uh, we're providing some additional parking for staff as well as uh, a new playground and some improvements as far as drop-offs. We know that you know, with the potential of charter school, uh, population that we want to make sure that we have the, uh, the traffic under control. Uh, with me today is uh, Ernie uh, Peters with Peters and Associates and if you have any questions about specifics about uh, traffic study we can talk with him about that. Uh, but this did go before the um, uh, traffic engineering department and has passed um, their approval. Uh, we're trying to get all the uh, parking uh, or all the, uh, the drop off and pick up to happen um, off the, uh, the street uh, there on the west side uh, and then also use that as a playground during the day so that it'll basically be gated off during the day and then convert it to a playground during school hours and then when it's pickup time the gates open back up it's it's um, used for uh, for drop off and pickup um, any questions that you all have that I'm glad to, to answer we do have additional cards but I have uh, one director uh, Director Wright, is your question for the applicant? Yes. Okay. Director Wright, you're recognized. Who is the applicant? you the architect. I'm the architect, yes. Uh, as far as the, the charter? Yeah. Uh, scholar made. I have with me also Dr. Anderson, Dr. Phyllis Anderson. That's who I want to hear from. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Phyllis Nichols Anderson. Okay. And I am the executive director of Scholar Made Educational Services. Scholar Made? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you all have been in existence how long? Um, Tell I, us a little bit about you. Oh, sure. Um, not a problem. I, am, I have been in education for almost 30 years, um, and I have worked in the Little Rock School District. Um, I worked at Henderson Junior High, at Hall High School, at J.A. Fair High School, as well as Man Magnet. Um, the last six years, I served as Senior Vice President for Lighthouse Academies Incorporated. I'm responsible for the establishment of five charter schools here in Arkansas. Also managed um, charter schools in Oklahoma, Washington, D.C., as well as New York. I've had the opportunity to manage multi-million dollar school budgets as well as renovations and construction. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. I do have additional cards uh, on this item, and I would like to recognize Barbara Smith. Good evening, board. My card had X in that for far and against. And my question is to Ms. A if, Anderson. Okay, if you'll I know. Thank you. As this is going to be, I noticed under there, the synopsis says public. Is this school, charter school, going to be open to the children in the neighborhood? Or are they going to continuously be bused when there is a school in their area? Because I love the uh, designs that you have. But I want to know if this charter school is going to be open to the children in the neighborhood. Well, thank you for that question. And um, I will ask Dr. Anderson if she will provide an answer for that. 
Um, Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, I got three minutes. Go ahead. State law requires that the charter school is open enrollment, which means that students from any where can apply um, to attend. We will have a lottery. Um, we do have within the charter applica application to provide uh, a preference to the people, to the students in the community um, as well. Mm -hmm. That was primarily one of the reasons why we selected the site was to serve the community um, and to have a community school. Thank you. Uh, Director Wright? Yep. Uh, another question for the applicant, please. Yes, ma'am, that's our desire. That, that's not a zoning question. I can't ask it. No. I don't think so. Director Wright, will you punch your button one more time? And I will not turn you off this time, hopefully. Mr. Carpenter says I can't ask that question. Well, then I will turn you back, back off. off. <laughs> That'll be the way we solve that. I th okay. I thought not, but I wanted to see if I could get it in. It was a good try. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, okay. I have a, a card. Ms. Smith, you have additional questions? No, it's not a zoning question, so we'll get that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith, for being here. Uh, I have a card from Senator Joyce Elliott. Uh. Good evening, board. Um, I'm supposed to be somewhere else, and might have been a good thing had I gone there, but this is more important to me than to someplace else. I have just for years and years wondered why in Little Rock we won't just come together and choose greatness. And the conclusion I've come to so we can't come together and choose greatness because we keep pulling ourselves apart. And I'm sorry I wasn't at the last board meeting to thank you, and I will do it tonight, for your resolution to support the Little Rock School District being made whole again so that we will have an opportunity to work together again because nobody can explain why we are under the the Bigfoot of the state at this point, other than the state's just choosing to do it. But at the same time, they tell us when we get our house in order, they'll be willing to lift the Bigfoot. But at the same time, the very same people are complicit in continuing to pull this school district apart. I am not anti-charter school per se. I am pro Little Rock School District but we can never get to where we need to be if we continue to be a part of constantly pulling ourselves apart. And I find it really interesting that people who don't live in Little Rock, who don't seem to have much interest in Little Rock except for charter schools, are putting millions of dollars into our district to pull our district apart. And they will not put one dime in the public school system, not one. And we can think whatever we want to about this, but I'm asking you, because it's uncomfortable, it's uncomfortable to be here to take this stand, but I'm asking you to take a stand just as you did when you voted for the resolution to make Little Rock School District whole again. How do you do that? when we are constantly pulling ourselves apart. At some point, somebody needs to say no, no matter how great the thought is. It's like trying to hold your family together, but the government keeps coming in, removing one of your kids and tell you, I'm gonna remove this kid, but the rest of the family is gonna be okay. That's what's happening to the Little Rock School District. I'm asking you to take a stand and vote no on this. We have closed, think about this, 
We have closed Franklin Elementary School. We have closed Woodruff. We have closed Hamilton. We have repurposed Wilson. And yet, we would open another school in the same district where we're closing schools. If we're ever going to be great, if we're ever going to be everything the kids and families deserve in this city, we can't keep pulling ourselves apart. And I urge you to vote no on this. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Elliott. Director Hendricks. Thank you. I want to respond to Senator about her comments is that she mentioned those schools that have been closed. I can go even further than that. They closed Ish. They closed Rysel. They closed Bush. They showed many Ish, many schools. And, and as a native of this town, this is nothing new. And I say to you, maybe I need to ask, does anybody know how many chartered schools are sponsored by a minority? Does anybody know? We have all, practically most of the charter schools that I know are owned by Caucasians. This is a minority. It's in my neighborhood. None of you live in the neighborhood. The people in the neighborhood has approved this application. So you can be tricksy if you want to, but I hope you don't. And I hope you're taking in what I'm saying. I want, I'm going to say it again, one of your board members to step and tell me if there is another minority that owns a charter school. Tell me. Dr. Who is that? Dr. Where is it located? Dr. I can't hear you. Would you turn on my Would you like to um, be recognized? Covenant Keepers in Southwest Little Rock at 5615 Guy Springs Road. My, okay. Director Wright. Um, I believe Mr. Moore said uh, Mr. Charles Stewart operates the charter school, Director Hendricks. Do you know where they did, where it's located? Do you know? Oh, well, uh, Tom said we're out of order. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to caution the board again. What you have before you is a zoning question. It is not a policy question on education. And the issue really needs to focus around that. When the, when the Ms. Smith, for example, mentioned the concept of will it deal with the kids in the neighborhood, she went on and said, because if they're going to be busing him in there, you know, that would be something that would bother her. Mm -hmm. Well, busing and traffic are legitimate zoning questions, and that was a proper comment. But what has happened to the school districts or what the Department of Education does in terms of allowing charter schools to exist is not a part of y'all's zoning rationale. Can I respond? Director Hendricks. Thank you. The thing that I want to say also is that um, Senator mentioned about this board telling ASA what to do, and, and I just don't think that's possible. I think where we really need to do, go and talk to ASA about the school district. I have another comment, Vice Mayor. Director Hendricks, are you finished? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Wright? Um, I don't have my tablet, so I can't pull this up. Why is this necessary to be a plain commercial district? It's all it's already been a school. Mr. Moore. Yes. Um, and I'll let Tony come forward. But uh, the difference, the main difference um, is that uh, when dealing with charters, uh, the main difference with public schools and charter schools uh, is that uh, charter schools don't have busing. So the whole traffic pattern and the uh, way traffic gets in and out of the neighborhood is, as Tom, Tom said, a legitimate public purpose to, to review. And so 
we feel, uh, of course, it was a Mitchell Elementary School that was open there, and it had busing, as, as regular elementary schools do. do. But uh, we look at charters a little differently, and this isn't. This is the same process we used on all of them because of the the review of the parking issue. Uh, we not only parking, but traffic patterns in and out of neighborhoods. So, Tony, if you want to add anything. Director Wright, Vice Mayor, members of the board, Bruce pretty much covered it all, but also it's a different site plan that was, I mean, this history, the PCD goes back to 2008. Schools were part of the approved use group, but we felt that over the years, a school never went in there. There was maybe some office use, but we felt it was uh, an opportunity to look at all aspects of the development and the site plan. And as Mr. Moore mentioned, an important part of it is traffic and circulation that, that can be generated by a charter school. And we feel that there's uh, a good plan. There are some conditions in the approval that the charter school has to comply with to ensure that there won't be any traffic problems, mm -hmm. such as backing up on Roosevelt Road and things like that. Thank you. Direct, Director Wyrick. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I'm wondering if someone could go over the um, parking spaces that are allowed at this location and then also um, some of the traffic patterns that Mr. Bozinski just addressed as to how the traffic is going to circulate in this neighborhood. I have forgotten how many students we're talking about coming in here, but if there's not uh, planned busing, uh, it, it could be an awful lot of people that are dropping kids off. And so it, um, I know the uh, attorney said we couldn't talk about the difference between charter and public schools, but that's one of the differences is that public schools have public transportation or school transportation to the schools, and you don't require as much um, traffic patterns, uh, ways that cars come in, park, let kids out. Uh, I'm looking at this document. It shows 18 proposed spark parking spaces in one location and 24 spaces on the other side. And um, I see Battery Street. I see Roosevelt Road. It looks like um, that there's no entrances off of Roosevelt Road. But can you give us some general ideas about what what the neighborhood can expect, what the traffic patterns and the number of students, and how many students did we expect? About 300 on the first year. 300 the first year. Yeah, I'll, I'll start us off and give some overview, and I'll let Ernie come up and talk a little bit more about specifics. <clears throat> if you wouldn't mind going to the site plan drawing. Yeah, so uh, 300 students, or actually 290, it will be the first year. And as the school grows, and it's, this is you know K through 9, right now okay so 10th 11th and 12th grades would have to be planned accordingly either if it can't be accommodated on this site and i can't tell the street so if you're going to uh, talk I'm about sorry. yeah roosevelt is to the right uh, north is to the left um, battery street is on the top of the page running left to right okay. uh, then we have uh, 24th street on the left hand side and then summits on the on the bottom of the page uh, and so the current situation is there's an existing parking lot with 20 spaces, and that's the one in the northwest corner of the property. Um, we're going to keep that one as it is. We're going to add another parking lot over there at the corner of Battery and Roosevelt uh, with an additional 24 spaces. Uh, we should not need all that space uh, on the first uh, year of, of school, uh, but we are planning out a you know, for the uh, overall growth over the next couple of years. So by year four, we'll have to figure out uh, some new strategies for not only classroom space, but also um, So that's 42 space. spaces. Did I do my math right? 42 spaces for parking? Yes. We also have an additional three spaces uh, off of Battery where there's sort of a, a, a drop-off area. Um, we have some ADA parking spaces there as well. 
So, so for, for um, a total of 45. Can you talk about how the drop-off area, how that works? Um, I see three spaces, and if we've got 290-something students, that's potentially 290-something cars, and we have three spaces to drop off. Sure. Wanna, How's I that going to work? I do want to just clarify that we will be providing transportation. So we will be providing bus transportation. Okay. So I just want to clear that up. So how many students do you think that will be participating in the bus transportation? Um, it's really uh, very hard to, because it's open enrollment, it's really very hard to uh, project. Um, we definitely will be providing transportation to students that live within beyond two miles and within probably 10 miles. So I, I project that probably based on ex my experiences that probably about 50% of the students will be riding Bus. buses. Okay. Okay. I'm going to let Ernie uh, Peters with Peters and Associates come up and address some of your Do we have locations for the bus, bus drop-off pickup? Can you point them out on the... Those would likely be along Battery Street. On the top of the page, you see the uh, purple arrow. That one comes down right in front of that, uh, the new link there in the middle. Uh, that's the ADA accessible primary entrance. Okay. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor Webb uh, and Directors, I'm Ernie Peters with Peters and & Associates. And uh, as I understand, the question has to do with the access and the circulation. Uh, just to further communicate the site and the surrounding streets, there is an existing traffic signal, as you may know, at Battery Street and Roosevelt. That's on the upper right corner of the exhibit that's shown here. Uh, and what we in, have envisioned is that the, the bulk, the largest portion of the vehicles that will be coming to the site and need to be accommodated for pickup and drop off will occur on the west side in a newly configured area uh, that is uh, shown in the loop there. It'll provide for a single point of access off of uh, Summit Street on the bottom of the exhibit here on the west side of the school and will loop in a one-way fashion around that uh, area that is being created there with a play area in the middle. Uh, it will be um, a uh, length of vehicle queuing uh, in the form of widening of Summit Street on the west side of the school that uh, will also take place to provide any additional vehicle queuing area on the street if they can't all get in the loop. But we've designed this and reviewed this uh, with the city public works staff and we, we believe that they're very comfortable with it at this point. We do have, as uh, Mr. Young has pointed out, the additional pick up and drop off area on the east side of the site on Battery Street side that can easily accommodate uh, bus pick up and drop off uh, at that side as well. Entry to the school will be provided on the west side and on the east side so students can enter from from either direction we're encouraging um, vehicle access leaving the site to go if they if they need to go uh, east on Roosevelt Road instead of trying to turn left at summit where there is not a traffic signal to go to the traffic signal and uh, use the signal for safe uh, access to Roosevelt Road um, parents could come from literally any direction, but uh, we believe that the, uh, the large majority of them will come and go via Summit and depart via Battery Street. Uh, we are doing some widening on Battery Street side too, again to provide some queuing and still provide two full lanes of uh, vehicle movements uh, north and south on Battery Street as well as on Summit. Uh, we have configured the queuing areas to be adequate in a way that is consistent with the way the Public Works has asked us to on previous uh, both public and charter school sites and we believe it's going to function very well um, and I'd be glad to answer any particular questions that any of you may have. Okay. Appreciate Director Wright, are you? Um, D Director Wyberg, are you? Yes, good? I'm through. Thank you. Okay. Director Hines? Um, I don't have any questions for for Ernie. Um, they, I, I, I kind of want to segue into what. I'm sorry. <laughs> I appreciate your patience with the 
turning people on and off. So, Director Hines. I wanted to concur with Director Hendricks. This is a multi-million dollar uh, investment in one of the uh, probably poorest and most impoverished areas of our city. Um, you know, this uh, charter, uh, if they do what they did in North Little Rock at the Capital City Lighthouse Charter, uh, it's kind of the same same area they've gone into. Uh, it was a stabilizing factor in that area. Um, I agree with Tom. Uh, the fight on whether or not this charter should happen should be at the charter authorizing panel, Senator Elliott, not here in this this uh, venue. We're here to decide on whether or not this is a good uh, use of the property and uh, whether or not it'll be beneficial to the surrounding neighborhood, which I think it will. So, Director Hendricks, I'll be supportive of this. Thank you. Thank you. Director Hendricks? This will be my final. I just want to tell you that immediately after the 1957 school crisis. My children were the first minorities to attend that school. And as far as the drop-off for the uh, students, on the, mark, on the Battery Street side, it's a curve that has been made which does not impede the traffic of the buses that come down that street. Uh, I, I wish that you all would drive by and take a look at that. And I don't think that we should punish uh, the applicant for something that happened at a state level. And I agree with uh, Director Hines is that this is not our, it's something I would love to say, but this is not our thing. But I really wish that you would really go by and take a look at that school. I was also instrumental in the sale of that property, which had been standing for years. And if you all would also know that a street light was put there for Mitchell School, so there's safety there for the children coming and going. That's my last comment. Thank you, Director Hendricks. Director Compuris. Bruce and Tony, <clears throat> would you go over the Planning Commission's deliberation on this and y'all's thoughts process? Mr. Brzezinski. Director Compuris, Vice Mayor, Board Members, the, at the Planning Commission, um, there was no deliberation. The item was on the consent agenda. There was nobody there in opposition. Planning Commission voted 11 ayes, 0 noes to recommend approval to this board, uh, approval of the PCD for Mitchell School. But give us the wisdom of your division rather than what your thoughts on this. Well, again, uh, this is, it goes, it was built as a school, and the original planned commercial development that goes back to PCD listed schools, both public charter schools, as uh, approved uses for the property. And there were several rev revisions after that, 2009, 2010, they added some other uses. And when this application came in, uh, we looked at the new site plan. Again, it was for a school, and traffic, circulation was a, uh, a big consideration. And with what was being proposed by the applicant for the queuing, the drop-off, worked, and that's why staff uh, came out with a recommendation of approval for the planned development. Thank you. Thank you, Director Compuros. Seeing no for uh, having no further cards and um, no further directors wishing to speak, we will move to a vote. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. no. The motion passes, or the ordinance passes. Excuse me. Uh, we will now move to ordinance number twelve. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you read the ordinance, please? An ordinance to approve a planned zoning development and establish a planned residential district titled Lawson Short Form PDR located at 324 Walnut Street, Little Rock, Arkansas, amending the official zoning map of the city of Little Rock, Arkansas, and for other purposes. We have a motion and a second to suspend the rules and move to a second reading. All in favor? Opposed? 
The motion passes. Madam Clerk, will you read the ordinance? An ordinance to approve a planned zoning development and establish a planned residential district titled Lawson Short Form PDR located at 324 Walnut Street, Little Rock, Arkansas, amending the official zoning map of the city of Little Rock, Arkansas, and for other purposes. We have a motion and a second to suspend the rules and place the ordinance on third and final reading. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Madam Clerk. An ordinance to approve a planned zoning development and establish a planned residential district titled Lawson Short Farm PDR located at 324 Walnut Street, Little Rock, Arkansas, amending the official zoning map of the city of Little Rock, Arkansas, and for other purposes. Thank you. We have uh, no cards and nobody um, has pushed the button. So we'll move to a vote then. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ordinance passes. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, will you read item number 13? An ordinance to approve a planned zoning development and establish a planned residential district titled the Crescent Chanel Long Form PDR located on the west side of Chanel Parkway, approximately one-seventh of a mile south of Northfield Drive, Little Rock, Arkansas, amending the official zoning map of the city of Little Rock, Arkansas, and for other purposes. We have a motion and a second to suspend the rules and place on second reading. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Madam Clerk, will you read the ordinance? An ordinance to approve a planned zoning development and establish a planned residential district titled the Crescent Chanel Long Form PDR located on the west side of Chanel Parkway, approximately one-seventh of a mile south of Northfield Drive. We have a motion and a second to suspend the rules in place on third and final reading. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Uh, Director Adcock? Yes, I would like a presentation by staff on this, please. Thank you. Uh, Bruce or? Do we need, do you want us to read it third time? Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. An ordinance to approve a planned zoning development and establish a planned residential district titled the Crescent Chanel Long Form PDR located on the west side of Chanel Parkway, approximately one-seventh of a mile south of Northfield Drive. Thank you. Zinsky. Vice Mayor, members of the board, item 13 is a tract of land located on the west side of Chanel Parkway, just a little bit south of Northfield Drive, which is south of Chanel Parkway. It's a 10-acre site, and the request before you is to rezone it from R2 single family to plan residential development to allow for an age-restricted multifamily project with a total of 221 units in two buildings, and there's uh, the applicant can go into more detail and then type of living arrangements. But again, it's 221 units on the 10 acres, which works out to 22 units per acre. This was heard by the Planning Commission at their uh, April 27th public hearing. The item was not on the consent agenda. There was uh, one individual that spoke in opposition, but there was a representative of the nearby plant, uh, property owners association that indicated that that group was in support of this development. After hearing both sides and the applicant, the Planning Commission voted eight ayes and two noes to recommend approval. Staff is not in support of this application. We're concerned about the substantial increase the density proposes for this site. Currently, the land use plan, the property is owned R2, which is single family. The land use plan currently shows this as residential low density which is typically up to uh, six units per acre. And again, as I stated earlier, this is proposing 22 units per acre, which is a very, we felt, a fairly dense development and quite a change from what's recommended um, with the land use plan. So that's 
why we've recommended denial. Tony, which neighborhood associations have been notified about this? Uh, Aberdeen Court Property Owners Association and Duquesne uh, Place Property Owners Association. And which property owners association was in support of it? Uh, Duquesne. Okay. And what are the age restrictions? Uh, 55 or older. How many parking places do they have? And is it covered parking places? Yes, they do have some covered parking. And Director Adcock, the total number of spaces Is the applicant here? Okay. Three, uh, is it 331? 304. 304. 304. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. where on this that we're looking at is 304 spaces of parking? That the lighter gray area, that's all the surface parking that's being provided. So as a cursor pointing all that out. Can we look at the other map on this, Scott? Maybe the zoning map. So this is R2 now? Yes. Okay. How close is it to the R2 on the bottom of it? What is the buffer between the apartments and the residents? And is this a multi-level? How tall is it? It's three stories. And how close is it over here at this little point on the left and the bottom to these houses? What is the buffer? The buffer on that air, on the area adjacent to the single na single family neighborhood is a hundred feet. Is that hundred feet open space? It, it's a buffer area. A that buffer area can't be feet. built. Is that on the left or on the bottom? That would be on, I guess, what would be the bottom. Okay. Okay, thank you. I think it would be helpful if we could hear from the uh, applicant. Uh, Madam Vice Mayor and uh, Alderman, um, my name is Larry Crane. I am the, um, my partner, Jace Jones, and I are the developers for this project. We uh, are excited about the project and if, if you would you like for me just to go through the I've got 13 quick slides unfortunately uh, Miss Adcock that doesn't the one with the parking I took out in, in a, an opportunity to be brief but maybe we can explain that more in more detail but the crest at Chanel is a, a, a luxury senior living community um, the there's a silver tsunami occurring in the United States 10,000 people are turning 65 every day and so the needs for housing are changing throughout the country and as well as in Little Rock. So we think uh, that we are going to be bringing a product to Little Rock that will not only benefit the residents, but will uh, benefit everyone as uh, all of us have family members that are growing older that want to stay close to where uh, their families are living. We think the Crest, Crest at Chanel is an opportunity uh, to provide that. So if we can see the next slide. It's a luxury senior living, senior independent living residences. There are 221 units, as Tony pointed out. 120 of those are completely independent living, which tend to be, tend to have just one resident living in each unit. And then 81 units are larger that could have, that would be suitable for a couple, uh, like a married couple. Um, they're a mixture of studio, one, two, and three bedroom floor plans, and they all have high-end finishes, tall ceilings, lots of windows. 
The common areas include dining, a walking trail, pools, courtyards, and social gathering areas. There are 304 total parking spots. The requirement for in the city is for 0.5 parking spots per unit for senior housing. Um, we wanted to be able to provide enough parking for a the biggest event that would ever occur there, which we're told by other operators is Easter Sunday, where a lot of family members will come and eat Easter lunch, particularly in Mother's Day, lunch with the residents there. So we think that um, we, we chose to add parking spots probably more significantly than are really required. Um, of those 304 spots, about 80 of those, or 76 to 80 of those, are underground, below level parking. Uh, the, the residences will be restricted to people that are 55 years of old, age or older. However, the typical age for these types of residences is probably averaging close to 80. And, and not in the low end of that 55 plus. We did work extensively with all of the neighbors. No one from Aberdeen um, that I'm aware of uh, came to any of our meetings, but the Duquesne neighbors, we had about 50 show up at a public meeting in March. Uh, we had several individual meetings. In those meetings, we made adjustments to our plan to uh, help the to make the, um, the development, the residence is more attractive to the neighbors uh, by creating parking that would not cause headlights to show into their backyards and those kind of things. We also agreed to increase the density of the landscaping using five foot wide and 12 foot tall evergreens to m create any kind of a, a barrier that's even there in the wintertime. So when the trees are leafless or leaves are off the trees, in the winter, uh, those would act as a barrier. Um, and again, we did receive um, uh, support not only for the project, but for the project instead of the alternative residential R2 development that would otherwise be built there. Uh, we did get the Planning Commission's approval on, on uh, April 27th. We also now have received Deltic's approval and the Chenoal Valley Commercial Neighborhood ACC approval which are, are required in order to build in the Chenal Valley neighborhoods. On the next slide, we'll show you that, as I said, there's, there's a lot of baby boomers that are, uh, that are graduating now and they're turning 65 at a rate of 10,000 10, a day. And that will continue over the next 18 years. And we believe that Crescent Chenal will help meet that demand. Next slide shows one of the, this is, uh, a, an exterior view that it calls out some of the exterior finishes, uh, all of which were approved by the Chenal Valley ACC. The next sh slide shows a little bit of how this, how our whole project um, is uh, in accord, or how it lays adjacent to the neighborhoods. And you can see that those dark green trees are all trees that will be untouched in the process of uh, doing our development. So those dark green trees um, will give the buffer between the neighbors and the neighborhood that a residential development would never have allowed. Those trees would have to have been removed completely in order to put a, a, a low density uh, residential neighborhood in. Um, we also, in those dark green areas, have agreed to put up to 50, make more if it takes it, uh, additional evergreens to uh, keep that going throughout to keep that screening working even in the dead of the winter. And then on the next slide we show uh, where we are relative to the other zoning uh, classifications. We're adjacent to a, an office, an O2, right across the street from us. And then if you notice there's a C2 zoning on Northfield that ba actually backs up to the Duquesne neighborhood. So we think we're a good buffer between the um, other uses around there. On the next slide, we show um, that in, according to the Institute of Transportation Engineers, there are only 3.3 trips per unit um, compared to 10 trips per unit per day for a single family uh, development. So while density is a little larger, 
it's way offset with a much lower trips per day. Now on the next slide, I show you a little bit more of how the whole project will look. Um, unfortunately, uh, the, the architect didn't really understand how many trees were going to be left on the Chenal Parkway side, so you could actually will have a lot more screening than, than, the, um, than that shows. Then on the next slide, we show the other elevations. Um, and you can see that uh, the slope is pretty dramatic below the, the Duquesne neighborhood so that the Duquesne, um, most of the neighbors in Duquesne will look right over the, pro uh, the top of the project and never be able to see it if they could see through the trees. And then on the next slide, um, we show a little bit of what you were asking about, Ms. Sadcock. Uh, on the active adult area on the right-hand side of the screen, you see a swimming pool. Well, that whole active adult area uh, uh, that surrounds the swimming pool will have underground parking in it. So that's where the 76 um, par underground parking spots are. And then you can tell, you can see that they, both buildings are connected with the common areas building, which where the dining, theater, lobby, uh, offices for the for the management of the facility will all be located. And then on the next slide, we have floor plans. Uh, you can see that there are some very small floor plans, and then they go up to larger floor plans, so that we would be able to meet a wide variety of of residents' needs in terms of their space needs. Again, some predominantly would be occupied by one resident, but some units might be occupied, occupied by uh, husband and wife. And then on the last slide, I think we're there almost, is um, a sight line study that uh, our, our, our uh, civil engineer, White Daters, uh, prepared for us and that we went over with all of the residents that shows that really there's no direct view of, the, of our property from any of the neighbor's property. Um, the sight lines with the trees there will not allow for uh, any real, any, any ability for um, the neighbors to be able to see our buildings. Is that our last slide? Oh, here's a real important one. This one is uh, from Paula Padilla. She is the president of the um, Duquesne Property Owners Association and she uh, we've met with her on, on many times, we've met with uh, concerned neighbors in the neighborhood, and uh, they got together as a board of directors and, and with their residents' input, and we agreed to seven points that were all uh, included in the application. And, um, and so the, uh, the POA for Duquesne voted to support the application. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crane. Director Compiros. Could you come back? Yes, sir. Could you, uh, is this a rental property or is this a condominium situation? Yes, sir, this will all be for lease, no, no for sale property. Then who manages it? So our company, um, we'll develop, we'll build it, and we will manage it through professional management company that we're hiring. But we'll be hiring directly the company or individuals who, who manage the property. Will it be on-site management? Yes, sir. Uh, typically, um, we believe the best, we haven't committed to this, but we believe that we'll have a couple that actually lives on-site that is the management couple. And can you tell us your experience in this sort of property? Uh, my experience in this is very limited. However, I have, I have studied the whole senior living area for the last three years extensively uh, through, the, uh, through you know, several organizations, the Multifamily uh, Executive Conference and the NIC and other sources. And, uh, the, and we've studied many of the competitors that are even one that's coming to Little Rock close by. So while my experience personally is limited in this particular area, I have over 30 years of, of success in other businesses, including other real estate developments. Okay. And then at the bottom of your slide, there was two groups, the, the Chenault Business 
Chenal Valley Business Group and then Deltic. Who are they? Which, what do they represent? So Deltic is the, the master developer for Chenal Valley. They're the owners, public, publicly traded company in uh, Arkansas and based in El Dorado and with offices in Little Rock. And they, they are the master developer in the Chenal Valley Commercial Neighborhood Architectural Control Committee is a uh, a control uh, architectural control committee that was established by the um, uh, what's the word for the BOA the the master covenants of the of Chenal Valley established the architectural architectural control committee and so we have very but they've been very rigorous to make sure that everything that we're that we're proposing is acceptable and consistent with with Chenal Valley neighborhood. Well, if memory serves me correctly, every time we have seen something in this area, that group has been here saying that they approve it, and they are on board with this. Yes, sir. We have a letter from them. The fact that Mr. Spivey's not here tonight is probably an indication that they approve it. But I'm sorry that we didn't bring a copy of the letter. I, we did provide that to the staff. Thank you. Thank you, Director Compuris. Director Hines. Um, thank you, Larry. I appreciate it. Uh, we uh, asked that this be added. They did get their approval from the ACC, and uh, it was added at my request to try to speed the process on for them. So uh, I think this is a good example of a developer working with the neighborhood and trying to get consensus. and. Uh, I'll be supporting the application. Thank you, Director Hines. Director Fortson. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Mr. Bozinski. Can you go back to your slide of the uh, site plan? I guess that's the one I want. No, that's not the one I want. I want the, the zoning map. I'm sorry. Uh, locate the decaying neighborhood on that map for us, would you? Uh, Director Fortson, that's the neighborhood directly south of, uh, I guess, south and, and west of the property in question, where the cursor is. That's Duquesne. Okay, and the, the uh, space uh, immediately across Chenal is all undeveloped at the present time. The O2 and OS, that's yes. correct. It's undeveloped. The, that, um, I'm sorry. The, Mr. Crane had some elevations that showed sight lines from the, as I recall, from the south looking to the west. No, I'm sorry, from the south looking north and from the west looking east. Uh, those elevations would be, I suppose, sort of to the right of the red mark looking back and then uh, from the undeveloped land looking toward the the Kane neighborhood. Is that correct? I think director Fortson they were uh, Mainly focusing on what the single-family residents Would see in the neighborhood. That's I didn't ask my question too clearly That's right and and really they were focusing on and perhaps I should have asked mr. Crane this focusing on these those dwellings that are immediately uh, uh, to the north of the development Where's your south, south of the building? South, south, right. Turned around. Um, okay, now, do you recall, Tony, what our, the density, we've approved a couple of these senior citizen living arrangements in the past couple of months. Uh, do you recall what that density was? Director Fortson, the uh, last one that was approved, the most recent one at Champano and R Rawling, what was referred to as Track 75, I think the density of that was uh, 16 or 17 units per acre. And uh, this is more than that. This is 22. Totally aside, it just occurred to me that uh, this will be the last regular meeting at which we'll have the opportunity to harass you. <laughs> and. Since I may very likely not be here next week, I just want to say I appreciate the 10 years I've worked with you and your candor and honesty and
dedication to your position, you will be missed. Well, thank you very I much. No I question. appreciate that. Thank you, Director Fortson. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Director Richardson. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Tony, I want to echo Director Fortson's uh, comments and one other question for you before you sit down and try to leave us. Uh, the track 75 uh, project, didn't we have a lot of opposition towards that? Didn't we have like some opposition with respect to that one that we're not having with this one? Director Richardson, there was the immediate neighborhood on track 75 was very much opposed to that development. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Seeing no further questions, we will uh, move to a vote on ordinance number 13. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ordinance passes. Thank you. We will uh, now move to item number 15. We will open the public hearing. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you read the ordinance? An ordinance to abandon the public right of way for an easement that is a portion of C Street located west of Walnut Street in the city of Little Rock, Arkansas, and for other purposes. We have a motion and a second to suspend the rules and place on second reading. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Madam Clerk, will you read the ordinance? An ordinance to abandon the public right of way for an easement that is a portion of C Street located west of Walnut Street. We have a motion and a second to suspend the rules in place on third and final reading. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Madam Clerk, will you read the ordinance? An ordinance. I'm sorry? You've got to close the hearing. Reading it the third time. Oh, I'm sorry. Before she reads it? <laughs> an ordinance to abandon the public right of way for an easement that is a portion of C Street located west of Walnut Street. Anyone who wishes to speak on this item? <laughs> you can do it louder. We will close the public hearing. Uh, and now we'll move to a vote. All in favor of this item? Aye. Opposed? The ordinance passes. Just as a moment, if you haven't noticed, uh, this is the first time I've done this, so I apologize for the few glitches that we've had. And I want to thank Allie for doing such a fine job tonight, too. Okay, we'll move now to item 16. I want to open the public hearing. Madam Clerk, will you read the ordinance? An ordinance to abandon an access easement located at 324 Walnut Street in the Glendale subdivision in the city of Little Rock, Pulaski County, Arkansas, and for other purposes. We have a motion and a second to suspend the rules and move to a second reading. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Madam Clerk, will you read the ordinance? An ordinance to abandon an access easement located at 324 Walnut Street in the Glendale subdivision. We have a motion and a second to suspend the rules in place on third and final reading. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Anyone, anyone who wishes to speak on this item? Madam Clerk, will you, read the, will you read the ordinance? An ordinance to abandon an access abandon an access easement located at 324 Walnut Street in the Glendale subdivision. Anyone who wishes to speak on this item? We will close the public hearing and move to a vote. All in favor of this ordinance? Opposed? The ordinance passes. Okay, we will... Um, now move to citizen communication, where we have three minutes. We'll be allowed to present specific items that have not been brought to the attention of the board and they're not on the agenda. A maximum of 30 minutes is allotted for citizen communication. 
Uh, no advance permission is required, but people wishing to address the city board are required to fill out a yellow card listing the specific subject to be addressed. Um, citizen communication is held at the end of the printed agenda on the third Tuesday of the month. And I have uh, several cards, and I will first call on Barbara Smith. Good evening, board. My comments are on the Rock Region Board, because I know that the city allocates funding for the Rock Region Board. And I have come before you early several months ago about some issues that we were having. Now, if you don't ride the bus, you have not a clue of what's going on. And some of the changes back last year when they notified the citizens to come to the meeting and voice their opinion about some of the changes, they were noted, but they were not taken into consideration. Now, in several weeks to come, they're going to have that same meeting about these same changes that you implemented in November. Now, we have no reason to take you at heart because you did not listen to us back in 2016. For example, uh, you took one of the bus runs off that inconvenienced people out in Southwest, number 15. And we have bus number 9, Barrow Road, that is a problem. You added blocks to us when we get off on Car Tie Drive to go to the Car Tie Council Center. We have to walk around that curve. But when you implemented those changes, you added three blocks to that, and we stated that in your meeting in 2016. And number 22, Arkansas Ortho Specialty Clinic that sits behind Sears and Roebuck, you took away the stop for those who go into that building and stated that a business did not want the bus to stop when you previously had to stop there. And we stated in 2016, those changes do not need to be implemented because they inconvenience people. Now you're coming again with the same meeting, asking these same questions again. What now? Because the city allocates money to them, then you all should uh, be with the passengers because it's supposed to be about the passengers, not about politics. So we're asking you all to come on board and implement these changes back to convenience the passengers, those of us who ride the bus. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And I will ask that we can look into that. Uh, Gloria Springer. Good evening, board. Um, my issue is has to do with um, rezoning of Granite Mountain property for the convenience mm -hmm. of 3M to mine closer to our homes. We heard about it after your agenda meeting of last week. We had never heard about it. We hadn't talked to 3M. Of course, we don't want mining closer to our home, so we don't agree. We are intending to speak with 3M, but naturally, the time is going to be short now. We have a lot of concerns. We've been here before. You know how we feel about our property. And one concern that we do have is that if the city of Little Rock wants Granite Mountain to be mined by 3M, let us prepare to move because we're surrounded by it. The city decided that that neighborhood should sit on top of a mine on the other side of Fush Creek, surrounded by trains and under airplanes and divided by trucks. The city or the school board decided that half of the school district would go, the half of the students would go to Little Rock schools, the other half would go to county schools, and you're dividing and conquering us. It's very insulting to be told by other people, besides our own director, that something as sensitive as 3M getting closer to our homes wasn't our business. Why our neighborhood association president wasn't notified after she's been notified for many, many reasons. And you know we've been here before. All of a sudden she gets unidentified as a person who would be concerned about 3M wanting to mine closer to our homes with no kind of buffers. They want open space and within 250 feet of a person's home has anybody ever done a study as to the health 
conditions of people in Granite Mountain or College Station, that does anybody care? I know the money that 3M brings to Little Rock is very important to this city. And those property taxes are worth nothing. And they'll be worth even less as that mining gets close to our homes. But we do not intend to just walk away. And 3M is ready to fight, and so are we. Thank you, Ms. Springer. Uh, Director? I don't, I don't know whether I understood Gloria to say that they were not notified. Yeah, you understood me to say that. Okay. The thing with that is that the, it's not my job. I didn't say it was your job. I told the board we weren't uh, notified. Ms. Springer. Well, look, Gloria, I know Ms. all Springer. about you. You okay? You know all about me? How insulting! You okay? You okay? You know all about me. I know you. How Ms. Springer, I mean, the please. The thing that I wanted to say was that the Neighborhood Association it was by accident, was not registered with the Planning Commission. And therefore, the Planning Commission did not notify uh, the Grand Mountain area. But College Station was notified. We had several meetings with the College Station people. In fact, I was there. And between 3M and the College Station, they were able to work out something for that area. But as Mr. Moore did tell me that they were to, 3M was to be on program today, but they cancel that. So it's going to be July what, Mr. Moore? 18th. July 18th, that they will be heard. But I do want that board to know it's not my responsibility to register a neighborhood association. It's their responsibility. Thank you, Director Hendricks. And because this was removed from the um, agenda, uh, we did get several yellow cards on that, on this item. And uh, it is appropriate to hear from those folks, and so I will continue to go through the yellow cards now and hear from the citizens who are here. Uh, Stephanie Ricks Fields. Good evening. I'm Stephanie Ricks Fields, and I'm speaking as the president of the Granite Mountain Neighborhood Improvement Association, which has been in existence for over 60 years after originating in the home of Jeff and Estella Hayes. I want to begin by saying our association appreciates the representatives from 3M for being willing to give us a chance to learn about their proposal. That will change sections of our land and our community from being deemed residential to mining, which in some cases will affect land that is adjacent to several homes in the Granite Mountain community. We had no idea about their proposal until last week's city board meeting. We did not receive any notification from the planning department until Monday, June 19th. Once again, I wanted to be here tonight simply to state and make it public record that no group, nor the Granite Mountain Neighborhood Improvement Association itself, agreed with nor met to understand 3M's land proposal. In fact, since we didn't find the land's proposal existed, we didn't know it until last week's meeting. I am grateful to Ms. Adcock for putting us in touch with vital information that helped us to set up a future meeting with 3M and our Granite Mountain Improvement Association, where we can learn about, discuss, and voice our opinions about their proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Director Hendricks. Um, Vice Chair, could I ask um, Tony to come to the mic? Mr. Moore. I just wanted to ask Vice him. Mayor, to, uh, Bruce, you, I just wanted him to verify why he did not, because it was not Irma Hendricks' responsibility. It's Planning Commission's responsibility. Now, I want Tony to come and tell them that he did not receive a notification that there was an a association. I want this to be settled tonight before I leave here, unless I can sell it after I leave here. I, I believe Mr. Brzezinski stated last Tuesday, Director Hendricks, that he was not aware, we, the city was not, the planning department was not aware that there was a Granite Mountain Neighborhood Association. He said that in the meeting last Tuesday. Yeah, well, I wanted this board to know also. I don't want stones thrown at me because I take care of my responsibility and nobody has to tell me when and where I'm supposed to be. Thank you. 
Director Richardson? Yes, it was just mentioned a minute ago that there's a feature meeting uh, scheduled. Will that meeting happen before we take a vote on this? I believe so. I think that uh, when we got the request uh, from 3M to defer this, um, that, that the pur main purpose was so that they could set a meeting, and I was informed tonight that there is a meeting set, uh, and I assume it's before the 18th. And were we not aware that there was a Naval Association out there? Did we know? Tony, I'm not talking to you. Director Richardson, Vice Mayor, members of the board, as you know, we notify neighborhood associations that are registered with the city when there's an item, most items that go to the Planning Commission. We look at that list and we mail those notices to whoever's listed as a contact. Granted, at the time that staff was sending those notices out, which is shortly after the application is filed, the application deadline is six weeks before the Planning Commission meeting. Staff looks at that list. It does show Grant, at that time it showed Grand Mountain Neighborhood Association, but the rest of the fields, contact, address, et cetera, were blank. There was no name. So obviously staff could not send anything out because we didn't have a name address because staff is very good about getting those notices out but if you don't have the information you can't get it out so but I think now we have Miss Fields name as the contact so typically to to get these neighborhood association registered with the city in order to to contact them with events like this we would have them listed and would have contact information as well is that how you say that and we didn't have it with this case we did not, at the time that the notices were being mailed, there was no contact information for Granite Mountain. Do we know how long they've been registered with the city? I mean, is there a process or a way we can go back and, and take a look at that? I mean, 60 plus years is a long time. And is there some, some mechanism we can go and look at to determine how long they've been registered with the city? Or that, an official notification list? The registration goes through housing and neighborhood programs, so I, I would have to get with Mr. Turner and see. Thank you, Tony. Director Kapiros. Tony, can I ask you a quick question? This will be easy. We're going to make you work tonight. It's well, I, I'm... From, right. from the time that a notice sent, you said six weeks is the time between the notice sent out and the time that we have a meeting. Six weeks is from the the deadline to file the application to the planning commission meeting. Typically, the notices staff tries to get them out within that first week, but sometimes it might be the second week. And in the this application was postponed by 3M, is that correct? Yes, they've requested a deferral this time. Well, I mean, it, it just seems like it would be fair to, for us to say, if six weeks is the normal time that a neighborhood has to talk with someone, that we postpone this for six weeks. I'm in support of that. One other question, Tony. Uh, the notification process, is that a responsibility of the applicant or the neighborhood association? Director, what? <laughs> I'm Director Curious, are you finished? No. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dean. <laughs> Thank you. Would that be a fair way of, of doing it to make sure that all parties, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything critical in deciding on when you're going to start, when you want to start mining something. Would that be a fair way of looking at life? I'll make the motion that we put off this for six weeks. Second. Tom, do we make motions in the middle of citizen communication that's now turned into board communication? Well, you're still in a meeting, so you can do that, but you already moved to defer this until the 18th of July. I think all you need to do is to amend that to defer it until the first meeting in August. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to defer 
those three items, I guess, to the first meeting in August, August 1st. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. So one more, t one more time, Tony, let me try to get this out before we let you leave us. Whose responsibility is it for the Norfolk case? Well, the 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 the, 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 the meeting, setting up the meeting, or whose responsibility it is to actually have the meeting that we're talking about? Is it the applicant's responsibility, or typically we wait on the neighborhood association to contact them? Uh, Director Richardson, typically uh, an applicant will reach out to a neighborhood to set up a meeting. And that's what you heard on the age-restricted housing that Mr. Crane contacted, uh, I guess, two different neighborhoods in that immediate area and did have meetings. And I think 3M, I know I went to one meeting called Station, but that was called by the College Station community group, the Progressive League. And I think there's been some other meetings after that. So how do we we gauge or measure whether or not that happens. I mean, if how do we do we know if there's a mechanism in place that we would know that uh, the applicant didn't reach out to the neighbor association and set up a meeting? It, it's not a requirement of the rezoning yes. process. It's suggested that if we think there might be uh, some issues or concerns that they try to meet with the neighborhood, but it, it's not a requirement. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I still have several yellow cards, but I have two directors left. Director Adcock. Uh, I did want to remind the board that for a number of years, Mr. Frank Broyles, who was an employee of the Parks and Recreation Department, was the president of this association. But I have campaigned six times, and every time I've campaigned, I went back and looked, and Granite Mountain was listed on my list with the information. And I've always known to go to Pilgrim's Rest Church to campaign for the Granite Mountain Neighborhood Association support. So they have been, whoever said how long have they been, Director uh, Richardson, I can tell you that I know for 25 years they have been on every list I've obtained on neighborhood associations. Well, I think one of the speakers mentioned that it's been 60 years. I'm sorry. I haven't been way. here that long. Oh, yes, you have. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 60 years. Our I'll remind you that we still have three yellow cards and would like to call on Karen Brooks. Hello, my name is Karen Brooks. I'm a resident of the Granite Mountain community, and I just wanted to kind of go back over what my neighbor said. We uh, are opposed to rezoning the area around our neighborhood to a mining area uh, for several reasons, such as the uh, increased traffic, health concerns with increased dust, um, and we just don't think it's a good idea for the residents there and especially with a lot of older residents who have retired from that area, and now you're going to induce more hazards to them with traffic and dust and just decrease their health. And I would just like for the board members to reconsider and not to change our area to something that makes it even more unsafe for us. And I'll make mine short and sweet. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Uh, Dolores Floyd. Floyd is my name now, but I was Dolores Stalkup Floyd, and I was born and raised in Granite Mountain area. So I'm real familiar with 3M, the airport, the trains in that area. There has, it bothers me that my parents raised me there, I moved, I raised my own kids, and I'm back in that neighborhood, and we're still dealing with the same problems that I grew up with. So I'm definitely opposed to 3M. Um, rezoning that area to do more mining. We already have enough problems in that area. With them rezoning to just increase that, my neighbor, neighbors, are in that 70s and 80s. So can you imagine having more traffic 
and more dust and more issues going on now. I just don't understand how they missed us in informing us on what happened, but I definitely want you all to know that we're not in agreement. My 80-year-old neighbor can barely walk. She couldn't be here to express her concerns. And I have several who are that age. They watched me grow up. Now I'm back in a neighborhood and what they said to me, I'm so happy you came back to your parents' home. Now we got somebody to keep our neighborhood going. So I could not, not come tonight to express my concerns about what's happening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Floyd. Kenyon Lowe. Vice Mayor Webb, board members, and uh, city manager Moore. Uh, there were some statements made last week concerning the south end uh, area of town. And for those who know me, I live and breed and die at the south end. Uh, there were statements that were made as far as historical significance. I, I know that I've applied four times to Brian Maynard to have the, that area declared as a historic area. Each time, it was shot down. Uh, I've talked to Travis Radiman up at the Arkansas State Preservation. It was shot down. Talked to Nancy Lowe when she was there. It was shot down. So it ain't like it hadn't been tried. It's just that the will hadn't been there to make a historic area. Let me take you on a tour of some of those historic places in the South End. Imagine on a nice spring day, smelling fresh bread, pastries, and cookies there in the South End on 33rd Street. Bakery by the name of Ham's Bakery between Pulaski and Cross. Let's go out to the Barton Coliseum that was completed in 1960, which qualifies for historic preservation, okay? Let's come back even further to the Artesian Spring there on Martin Luther King. It's been there well over 100 years. Let's start with the post office that was there at 33rd and Chester Street before it moved up to Roosevelt and State, before it finally moved over on Main Street. Let's talk about Catholic High that was there at Roosevelt and State before they moved out uh, over uh, on University. Uh, let's talk about the Negro League, okay? A lot of people don't know, there were four Negro League teams that played in Crown Park. That was the Little Rock Grays, that was the Little Rock Stars, that was the Dubas and Tigers, and that was the Little Rock Travelers, who were owned by the Arkansas Travelers, played in the season of 1932. They played at Cavanaugh Field, which is now Quigley Stadium. So it ain't like that the area's not historically sound. Um, Mr. Crump, um, where Sims was before they moved up on Roosevelt and Broadway, started the first free school lunch program here in the city of Little Rock, okay? It was there at the South End Elementary School, which was six long wooden buildings. The last one standing happened to be the South End Boys Club, which Mr. Thrasher took over. But Mr. Crump, provided whatever those kids needed there in the South End. And Mr. Thra Mr. Thrash came in and supplemented that. So we want to talk about neighborhoods. I remember as a kid, okay, freshly manicured lawns, plenty of grocery stores when those type of areas shouldn't. There were four. We had George Williams store there, Center Star. We had uh, Trimble's Dairy Bar, some of the best hamburgers in town. You had the Reverend uh, Duggar Johnson, who was Pastor Emeritus in St. Mark. He had one store there on uh, 29th Street between Fulton and Ringo. Then he had the last one up on Martin Luther King with the old cobblestone store. And of course, Crumbs Grocery. With that said, I ask you, and I'll come back to keep submitting those requests, and plus Mr. Daisy Bates on there at 28, that we have that area declared as historic area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lowe. That concludes the citizen communication. Uh, Director Hines, did you still want to have a comment? Yes, and then Tony, director. could you come up here one more time? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Since this is going to be your last meeting with us, I couldn't get away without pulling you up here. I have one more next you have, Tuesday. Do you have next Tuesday? Yes, All right. Sir. Well, this is the last full full board meeting, so we get to do it. Uh, I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciated working with you over the last several years. One of the things I did when I was running for my seat was I sat down with as many department heads as I could before I got elected to kind of really get a take on the on the city's uh, business. And, and I want to appreciate your candor 
and we haven't always agreed, but I know that your opinions are, are heartfelt and rooted in, in good planning, and I appreciate that, that you've always stuck to your guns and, and, and been a good negotiator in those terms. And I want to say I appreciate working with you, and thanks for your service to the city. You've made it a, the great city that it is, and I want to tell you I appreciate that. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Director Hines. Director Wright. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I want to go back to our last speaker, and I have posed a question for the city manager. If he, if he can't answer, if he would get an answer. I would just like to know, for my own edification, why that area has not been declared an historic district. Director Wright, um, I sent you sort of an outline of a process on Friday. Um, as a result, you, it was kind of narrowed about the spring, mm -hmm. but um, I, I made it broader to talk about how an area goes uh, about, the, and it is, it is citizen initiated with the state, mm -hmm. and I outlined the steps. I just gave that memorandum to Kenyon, mm -hmm. um, and we, we assist, but it really starts with a citizen or a group. Loretta did it um, uh, a few years ago. Loretta Hendricks did it. That's what I was talking about. Um, and uh, so I outlined that. And for that area? She did it for that area? No, she did it up, uh, up north of there. But was she successful? She was. So maybe you, they can, the group that was here, maybe they can emulate that process, or maybe she can provide some technical assistance, because it sounds like you have a lot to preserve. Yeah, and again, I just I gave uh, King a copy of that memo, or Mr. Lowe a copy of that memo, and uh, and then our staff is there to assist, but it really is initiated by uh, a resident. Well, I understand that. I, it just seems, you know, I have nothing historic. Well, I got a couple of spots, but you know, y'all, <laughs> and it just seems like such a shame that you know that we can't get that done. But a lot of smart people live up there, so hopefully this time around it'll happen. Thank you. <coughs> Director Hendricks? I think, did you talk from here? Did you turn your light on? Well, I know Dean had his light on, but apparently he cut it off. Mine has to do with an emergency, and Mr. Moore and I have talked about it, but this is for Tom. Tom, we have in the neighborhood, in Ward 1, about 250 tires, car tires, across the streets from my son and his wife at 2301 Pine. Is it anything that we can do short of waiting until July to go to court? Now, I have been told by the court that this issue derived from housing. Could you, those uh, tires have been in that yard almost six months. My grandchildren have to suffer mosquito bites from where water has accumulated in those tires. This is at a residence, at, and I, I, we would love to see a suit or something for those tires to be moved immediately. This would not happen in the West, and I hope that you all would agree with me. You should go by, all of you should go by 2301 South Pine. At least 200 or more tires, auto tires, not bicycle tires, and my grandchildren can't even play outside because of mosquitoes. I'd like to just read an, an update because uh, I've got this today, if you don't mind, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman, uh, Mr. Combs, was issued a notice in November of 2016. After several attempts, he was issued a citation in December of 2016. He did not show for court, and the FTA failure to appear warrant was issued. Mr. Combs was again noticed by code enforcement on January of 17, and after several attempts, another citation was sub subsequently mailed. Mr. Combs again did not appear in court on 322. Mr. Combs was cited on a dog-related charging at that time, and the failure to appear warrant was served. He is scheduled to go on trial on July 13th of 2017. Uh, so this is an example of, you know, We've done everything we can. Um, you have to move those tires. And so, well, this is, I just, hand, you know, it's interesting that you said they've been there for six months, but this is the first I've just heard about it. So, but 
the staff was aware of because obviously in December they sent a they, they they tried to get him in the court at that point. Look, may I speak? But Mr. Moore, I appreciate what you're saying, but again, should tires stay in a person's backyard that long? It ought to be something that Tom could do to Is cite the suit to get these tires moved out. Or do you want my son to sue? I don't care who would like to sue us, but that Director Hendricks, the the key is this, he's got a trial date set for the 13th. Once he's convicted, which I can think of no reason he wouldn't be except the tires are removed, then we can go in and we can do some action to try to take him. Other than that, we're going to have to show that it's an immediate health hazard, and I don't think we're going to be able to make that, and I'm pretty sure we're not going to be able to make it in the next three or four weeks anyway, so I think we've got to follow through with the judge and deal with it at that time. And one of the things we will request is a maximum fine and daily fines and that the injunction be put in place to remove those tires immediately. But Tom, all those times that Bruce has, Mr. Moore has mentioned that this man did not respond, you mean to tell me you all gonna sit there and just let him do nothing? You can't do nothing? I don't believe that. Well, in America, we have this very strong rule that you don't get convicted unless you're before a fact finder. And the only exception to that is somebody that starts a trial and then absconds. Okay. This man has not appeared in court. And we ended up catching him uh, eventually, and now we've got a trial date set. Okay, let me ask you this, and I don't want to prolong the time. Before he was cited in court, are you telling me it was nothing that the city could do to get those tires out of that backyard? Well, under the statutes, we've got to give him notice in a certain number of days to get it out in the first place, and then we can cite him, and that's well, what we Let me we ask get. you this, and I'm being facetious. If those three or 400 times had been out west, you telling me you were going to wait to a court date? I don't believe that. Well, I will tell you that we've had tires out Cantrell, which is west, but I don't think it's the area you're talking about. Was it anybody? That's right. And we've had problems with enforcement and those types of things, too. I mean, this is... Getting these people into court and getting a judgment, it's not an uncommon problem. My last question, the many times that he's been cited and he did not appear, what do you do with that? Well, it goes into the warrants division, but the, the fact, if, if we were an incredibly small town, we could serve all of our warrants the next day. We're not. Okay. And so we've got to make a choice of do we want to use our police department to deal with ongoing offenses like we've had in the last few weeks, or do we want to go out and serve misdemeanor warrants? So I get a doctor's statement that my ch grandchildren are suffering from mosquitoes. Thank you. Director Compuris. Bruce, this is for you and Sarah. Um, I was reading my Friday communication and <clears> had <throat> looked in the paper and we have, the interest rates have gone down again historically to a low level. Is there any wisdom in looking at all of the items on the back of that sheet as far as long and short term obligations and bonding and to see if we should be doing any refinancing to capture either a lower rate or to be able to refinance and do different things? Uh, there is, and we're we're currently doing that. Uh, in fact, we have one coming before you regarding the parks bonds, and we regularly look at that with our consultants. And there might be some additional ones we bring forward. Well, I'd appreciate because this is a optimal time to do that. And there are, there are more things on the back of that sheet than I've I should have known they were there, but I have not looked at it in that regard. So thank you. Thank you, Director Compuris. We have no further cards or requests to speak. We have a motion to adjourn and a second. All in favor adjourning? Aye. Opposed? Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>